the summer, the beginning of the summer, June, July, I started a series of this church. If you're joining us today for the first time, I'm saying, oh, this is you can benefit. I'm also bringing a panoramic view to the entire thing so everybody can end at the same place. Uh, uh, the, the beginning of June and July, uh, we took from Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh. Proverbs in the Bible is celebrated by Christians because it's the book of wisdom. Book of wisdom. So, and wisdom, by the way, for those who are interested, is the application of knowledge. So, knowledge is no good unless you can apply it. Amen. Let me say this again knowledge is no good unless you can apply it. And so, uh, Solomon in his, in, his, in his statements of wisdom says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so, in being a Jew, taking that as the root scripture, I began to break down this whole process of thinking in your heart. Now, the first thing we have to agree on is that we don't think in our hearts. So, there is a little bit of tension within the text because you don't really think in your heart. But your heart forms an important part of your behavior. How is that true, Bishop? Your heart supplies the emotional input necessary for you to think, feel, think about the thoughts that you think and feel about them. You see, has somebody ever asked you, let me make it practical, somebody ever asked you, hey, what do you think about such and such? And you didn't answer immediately because you didn't know how you felt about it. And you, you so you were, you were hesitant. And I know, you know, I'm one of those people who live in my head. So when you ask me stuff off the cuff, I try not to answer because I, you know, I don't know how I think about it because I don't know how I feel about it. So I say, I don't know what I think. Let me give you a chance to think first. And then I'll tell you what I think based on how I feel. And so there is a thinking, feeling relationship that is occurring in all of us that drives our behavior. And so as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If your life is a product of what you're thinking and feeling, then maybe if you don't like the product the life is giving you, then maybe you ought to check your feelings or your thoughts. Uh -huh. I stopped, uh, I was greeting everyone at the uh, greeting session this morning, and I greeted Mr. Amen Marie. I said, how was your week? She said, fantastic. And she smiled, and I said, wow, was that good? She said, yes, I'm living my best life. <laughs> and I went, wow. <laughs> now, all of her feeling was coming out in that thought. Uh, but it was evident that her feeling, her heart, and her mind was congruent or in agreement with the statement that was coming out of her mouth. Have you ever had somebody respond to you and say, I love you, but you couldn't feel it? Right, amen. Their mouth said the right thing, their thoughts said the right thing, but their heart was not in congruency with the statement. Oh, I wish I had something. Mm. 
Lord, have mercy. And sometimes it catches the other person at surprise, but guess what? Sometimes it catches you at surprise. Because you didn't know that you had unresolved stuff in your heart. It is that unresolved stuff that hopefully by now has started to change your prayer life. Because now you're praying, and when you pray privately, you're bringing to God the issues that are in your heart. It seems easy to pray for somebody else. It's easy to say, God, you know, help that bald-headed fellow over there, help that, that, that young lady who thinks she's cute. But, but when it comes down to me, I gotta deal with my issues. And, and God is not looking for our prayers to be surrounded by vows and dies and, you know, great sweating scriptures. He's, he's looking for the moment of intimacy. One person, uh, so we quickly said intimacy, Lord, into me, see. And so our ability to be transparent and naked before God is that I've got some issues. And I've been struggling with these issues. And I've been trying to fix it on my own, but I can't fix it. So here I am, Lord. I surrender my all. Anybody ever pray those kind of prayers? So uh, we preached about the heart, and I walked away realizing that there's some stuff that's resolved, and there's some stuff that's unresolved. And some of the stuff that's unresolved is driving some areas of our lives. It's also dictating our attitude. And some of us have attitudes about stuff that is determining how we think about stuff and how we feel, but it's really based on unresolved stuff. And most of us are scared to touch that unresolved stuff. Because if we touch it, we don't have to deal with it. It's that young man that has daddy issues. That young girl that has rejection issues. That adult that's still trapped in the childhood issues of the past. That husband that is still struggling how to be a man. And now has to be a husband. These issues are real to our life and ultimately real to all of us saved them out. But it has to be dealt with in prayer. Somebody put your hand together and pray for that. We transitioned after about four, five, six weeks of heart issues into thought issues. For the Proverbs 23 and 7 says, As a man, a woman, think of their heart, so are they. And so we start to deal with the thought process. And we realize in this series of messages on thoughts that there is a distinct difference between your mind and your brain. I myself, when I started the message, didn't really consciously realize that. But after seriously preparing and studying, I realized that in a step of the brain it has uh, particular uh, neuron relationships that ultimately drive the mind, which ultimately drive the mood, which ultimately drive what you think and the patterns of your thoughts. Notice the words patterns of your thoughts. See, if you don't trust people, you always have a mood of defense. If you have resentment issues, you'll always have a certain mood associated with that. And those thought patterns in your mind ultimately sends those messages to your brain. And your brain sends out that message to your entire body based, and the body starts to act in congruency with a mood that suggests I don't trust you. So we've got to come in order to bring ourselves to a place where, as a man or woman, think it, so is he. We've got to work on this mind relationship. And we have to now mind our own business. Mm -hmm. Most of us are good at minding other people's business. Mm -hmm. But who is it that's eligible to throw a stone when you live in a glass house yourself? And Jesus said to the man who caught the woman in the act of adultery and brought her, and they were getting ready to stone her, he says, you that are without sin, you throw the first stone. He looked up, everybody was there. Everybody looked at themselves and realized, I got issues too. So it's in this last portion of your mind uh, that we spent the last couple of weeks, and today I want to close in this issue of the mind and the thoughts we ought to be thinking. I did all that to be able to bring you up to speed so I can take you now into the word of the Lord and to share with you, amen, praise God. Uh, the root scripture we have been using comes out of Malachi. And Malachi 3 and chapter, uh, Malachi 3 
And verse Malachi chapter three and verses thirteen says, uh, "The words, no words have come up before me and have been stout against me. Yet you say, What have we spoken against thee, Lord?" Verse fourteen. For you have said, "Is it vain to serve God? What does it profit? What does it profit uh, if we keep all your ordinances and walk before you mournfully?" Verse 15 says, Now we call the proud happy, and they that work wicked, they are set up, yea, they are tempted, God are even delivered. Verse 16 says, And they that fear the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and the book of remembrance was written before him, for them that fear the Lord and thought upon his name. Verse 17, And they shall come shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts. And in that day when I make them my jewel, I will spare them as a man's spirit his own that serve him. Verse 18, then shall I return and discern between who is righteous and who is wicked. May the Lord have his richest blessing upon the reading of his holy word. Amen. Praise God and consecrating our thoughts. It is out of those thoughts uh, that I have been uh, trying to get our church to a place of understanding that your thought matters. Your thinking pattern matters. What's going on in the, between, between your ears and the brain matters. Your mind is sending impulses, sending signals, sending things to your brain, ultimately driving your thought life. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Proverbs 4 23 says, Above all, amen, guard your heart. For out of it flow the issues of your life. Above all everything, above your shout, above your dance, guard your heart. Somebody say, guard your heart. From Ephesians 4, 22, in regards to the former ways, put off your old self, which is corrupt and deceitful desires, and be made new in the attitude of your mind. Somebody say the attitude of your mind. In other words, the Bible declares that your attitude is all is being driven by what's going on in your mind. The text I have read before you begins in the book of, book of Malachi to say that God says, I know the thoughts you've been thinking. And since your thought life drives your attitude, he says, I understand that some of you all haven't been praising me like you should, haven't been going to church like you should, haven't been worshiping like you should, simply because there's stuff on your mind. What's on your mind is the question of what is the reward for really serving God? And what is it that it, what, what is the reward for praising him? What is the reward for living for him? What is the reward for being in church every Sunday? It doesn't really matter. And so the text that has been lifted up in Matthew Malachi reminds us that it does matter. Why does it matter? Malachi writes three reasons, and I want to give you those three reasons, one of which I have already, so I'm going to again just take a few minutes and recap it. The first reason is that God remembers his own. Somebody say, God remembers his own. Do me a favor, help me involve your neighbor, touch your neighbor, and say, God remembers his own. You see, if you belong to God, God remembers. How do I know? The Bible says in the text I just read, they that fear him. Mm -hmm. They that fear him. Now, it's kind of it's, it's kind of touch and go as a thought because in our world, not a whole lot of people fear God. Oh and so we are accustomed to people acting like they don't really care what God thinks. But here's what the Bible teaches about the fear of God. Proverbs 9 and 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. The, the, the Bible says, I don't care what your degree is, I don't care your achievements, I don't care what school you think you graduate from, I don't care what, how much money and what you got going on. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which means without the fear, you're not going to dress up for it. Proverbs 8 and 13 yes. says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. In other words, people who fear God hate evil. Somebody just repeat that, I hate evil. Come on, say it like you really do. I hate evil. Now don't look at anybody when you say it because they didn't let people talking about them. <laughs> Philippians 2 and 12 through 13 says, Obey, amen, the Lord, amen, praise God, always in his presence. So your fear is tied into your obedience. Psalm 112 verses 1 says, How blessed is the man who fear the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Touch your neighbor and tell him I'm blessed. Why? Because I fear the Lord. Psalm 100, Psalm, Psalm 30, 128, verses 1 through 4 said, 
blessings are on the house of them that fear the Lord. Psalm 34 and 7 says, The angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear the Lord. I wish I had it. I'm not too far. The only reason your house is still protected is because you fear the Lord. Oh, God. They broke in the, across the street and vandalized that house. But when they walk by your house, the smoke of the angels of the Lord was in the ground of the Lord. I wish I had two real praises. Thank God for the house of the angels. And angels are on your side. Not only that God remembers his own because they fear the Lord and because he's got to dispatch angels on everybody where he finds the fear of the Lord. Because if he doesn't dispatch angels on those who he finds the fear of the Lord, he's in opposition to his own word. Mm-hmm. And so not only does God, amen, praise God, amen, does God remember his own because they fear him, but God records the character of those that fear him. Can I get a witness in here today? God is paying attention to what you do. God is paying attention to what you say. And there's the times you taught me this years ago as a young boy in church. Maybe God sees when nobody else is looking. I wish I had somebody. It doesn't matter who you impress when folks are looking at you. Uh huh. Because some folks know how to fake the funk, act the actor, talk the talk, understand church means. But God is looking at does your private life match your public life? Mm-hmm. If you can't sit there and say, ouch, it's still true. So, it not only does God you know, uh, remember his own, but God records your character. And your character is who you are in the dark. Secondly, God records your contemplation. How do I know that? Malachi 3 says, and those who fear him thought often of his name. So, God recorded knew what they were thinking. If you ever preach to your name, I said, God knows your thoughts. Mm-hmm. He knows the ones you didn't act on, and you, he knows the ones you certainly acted on. Now, can I pause and tell you? Sometimes we act like the devil is bigger than God, but the truth is, the devil don't know your thoughts. But God knows your thoughts. He knows the thoughts you think to us. Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes we act like the devil is bigger and better, but the truth is, he's not bigger than God. He knows your power. He knows your contemplation. He knows your conversation. Ah, Lord, have mercy. The Bible says in that, I just read, amen, he knows the thoughts of them who talk often one to another. Can I pause? You know, there are always some folks who are bosom buddies and who have good conversation. And you, and you know, they, they support each other emotionally, positively, and negatively. Uh, but God records your conversation. Here's why that is important. Because when you get to heaven, my friend, and you stand at what's called the mercy seat of God, uh, amen, praise God. He's going to play some tapes on you and play some tapes on me. And we're going to have to say, God, listen, is it too late to apologize for what I said? I'm going to leave that little 
limited amount of time, but even you got to balance out your work church life, your home church life, your children and church life, your responsibilities and church life. You got to balance it. If I learned anything in 30 years, in 32 plus years, Amen. I've had job offers that I had to turn down because it required working in times that I needed to be in church. And, and, and how would y'all like me come and say, this what saints, I got to pay some bills, so I'm not, I'm not, y'all figure this out. I'm not there. No, I had to make a commitment. I had to say, amen, no matter what they're talking about, what they're talking about, my, me and my house, me, I belong in the house of the Lord. And, and let me tell you something, I got the same bills everybody got. In fact, in case, I got more business than going that. Amen, praise God. But I have to believe that I can trust God, amen, that he'll work out the rest of it. And so, amen, praise God. I remember as a young boy when I first started, started pastoring this church, amen, I didn't have a job. Amen, they got the company that wanted to hire me at the interview says, we like you, we're going to hire you, you're going to start, and you're going to work every Saturday and Sunday. Your days off are going to be um, Wednesday, Thursday, some places in the middle. I said, thank you, but no thank you, I can't work on Sunday because I got to be in church. They looked at me kind of strange because they're not used to both saying stuff like that on the interview when you ain't got a job.